Hi, I'm David Smith. This is Samuel Petresky. Sorry, gonna say your name there. <clears throat> I work at Georgetown University. I also own my own, my own digital forensics company. And uh, I'll look at Sam get in. I was gonna. Everything's in the guide. Just read it there. Samuel Petresky, work for Georgetown University as well. Um, I run my own consulting company, mostly in network um, security architecture. So I design big, big stuff that would fit in the enterprise. And uh, we're going to talk to you about uh, forensic methodology here. So the idea is that. So anyway, I came up with this idea. I was actually reading a white paper. And it was a fantastic white paper. And I definitely recommend you go and take a look at it. I put the important things up on the screen. But um, it compared a lot of digital forensic methodologies, broke them up into like a standard phases and which ones have which. And, and, um, <clears throat> and it's, it's just kind of that normal go and collect it and make sure you have your warrants and, and all those types of things. But it did a really good job of just saying, hey, there's so many out there, you know, what's missing? And so a lot of the methodologies, I, I thought none of them out there really were what I taught. I run teams of forensics folks and, you know, I'm always like getting a new guy and, you know, having a good guy that's learned a lot of good things, head off to his own organization or start his own company. And so I found myself in the same little groove of like, here's what I want you to do and here's how I break it down for you. So I wanted to actually, uh, this was the idea I had and just, you know, why not take all of these processes and turn them into a real methodology? And I did really in my head say, okay, what's the really difference between a methodology and a process? And so I broke it up. And so what I think I really have is a methodology. So, um to start off, we're going to look at some of the existing methodologies and uh, how they compare and kind of look at what's really good at them. And then uh, we're going to kind of try to show you where our methodology really fits into. So this is the first paper where the idea came from, where Dave was talking about initially. Uh, this is a really good overview paper. So if you want to find out what kind of methodologies are out there, how they uh, propose that the, uh, method, the forensic work works, um, they analyzed about 13 different papers. It's a little bit older now. I think it was published in 2008. But uh, they looked at 13 different methodologies. And they found that different methodologies, methodologies had different number of phases. Some of them had four phases and some of them I think had 21 phases. Um, and so what they did is they um, grouped everything in five common phases uh, on the right hand side as you can see there. And then they mapped the existing phases that the methodology had into uh, their four or five phases here and see where they would fit in. And so the conclusion of the uh, analysis paper was really um, most of the methodologies out there would fit within the four phases. Most of them fit into the five phases of um, of their proposed model. But in essence, uh, all the methodologies have the main components there. Who's a Brian Carrier fan? Okay, all right. <laughs> cool. So um, as I mentioned, the different uh, things that what we found is the different methodologies have the same main components. Um, basically, how do you authorize the investigation? You know, do you get the right data? How, how do you acquire the images the proper way? Have it so it's uh, admitted in court uh, later on if you need to. Um, then how do you define the valid technologies or techniques to find the data that you're really after it? And then at the end, how do you produce a report that's really meaningful to the requester and uh, shows that the information that they requested really is there or it's not there? So a uh, quick uh, show of hands, how many of you are just getting into for forensics, like uh, just getting there? Excellent. How many of you just do forensics kind of regular basis, um, medium level kind of? And how many of you are experts? Do this in and out all day long? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. So um, I think our presentation here is mostly going to focus on the beginner and the in, um, intermediate level of uh, uh, people that know how, what to do with forensics and show them some uh, tools and methodologies what they can use there. And then from the experts, we really want their input because um, at the end of the day, really this whole methodology is how an expert uh, digital forensic analyst it has the conversation within their head when they're analyzing a methodology or when they're performing a forensic job. So we really want to kind of have pick their minds, get the information from them, and then have that information available for everyone to be able to go through the process and at the end of the day, we should all be able to produce the same type of result. 
So a um, couple other methodologies that we looked at, uh, really what's the digital and forensic methodology, the Department of Justice has a pretty good uh, process overview. They outline uh, seven different processes there that they think or they uh, want to use in their uh, methodology. And so they have everything from obtaining the data, getting the proper um, authorization, getting the requests done properly, acquiring it, extracting the, the important or the relevant data out, um, analyzing it, and then producing the report, and then kind of overview of the whole process, what worked, what didn't work. And so they go into a little bit more detail into each phase and uh, have a pretty good flow chart. I'm not going to go through them, but this is something if you're interested in figuring out what their processes are and what they recommend of doing, it's, it's pretty neat. And so they have the preparation and extra extraction phase. Uh, they go through the whole flow there of how, you do, how do you go through the whole process of getting the data the proper way and acquiring it. And then the second is the identification. So we have the data now, but how do we find out what's really important for the case type that we are working on? And then the third one is really the analysis, right? We got the data, we have the information there, but now uh, we need to analyze it to see really what's in there. And so their iterative process is pretty, uh, pretty good here into going through all the steps of who, what, where, what, you know, how, and uh, all the other processes to get the right information there. This mic? Yeah. yeah. So, um, kind of a conclusion of the overview. Uh, there are really good processes out there or methodologies that uh, have been documented. There are a lot of white papers that, uh, if you really are getting into this area, I would highly recommend reading them. They're very valuable. Um, the integrated digital investigation process, uh, they have. Uh, a really nice uh, paper out there that uh, outlines the whole uh, methodology that they recommend. There is a digital forensics research workshop that they uh, publish different papers all the time. And um, they also, you know, talk about those five phases that we mentioned initially. And then um, the enhanced uh, in integrated digital investigation process, they even have a dynamite phase. I love that. I actually wrote that line. <laughs> How cool is a methodology that has a dynamite phase? Wow. <laughs> So anyway, so that was kind of the overview, and what we want to get into is um, what are the problems with digital forensics? Why is it hard? Why are there experts and, and people have a hard time picking it up and learning it? And I think the number one answer is that it's an open solution set, right? There's many, there's many ways to find the answer that you're looking for, and I talk about a few of those in a little bit, but it's just, there's many, many ways of solving. It's a lot of self-teaching and just sitting to it, right? You can sit there, you can, expert will take two hours, and somebody who's just learning it may take 12 hours, whatever. But a lot of it is just sitting there. You're like, I'm gonna run this registry. Oh, that didn't really pay out for me. I'm gonna, you know, run all the link files. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And then, uh, it actually takes a lot of discipline. So kind of one of the differences I see when I, when I see beginners and I see experts is that the experts are really disciplined. They're like, I'm not gonna do keyword searches on all these terms because I know it's gonna produce you know, two million hits and I'm not gonna cycle through them, right? So it's, it's, it's that patience, that, it's that determination that uh, stay on target and I just had to say it. And uh, you also have to do a lot of learning while you're sitting there and there's gonna be something new, right? So the first time you got a job that had a Vista shadow, right? And then, you know, you're like shadow copy and you're like, oh great, how do I do this? And you're looking up on Sands or trying to talk to Rob Lee or something like that. So uh, it, you gotta learn new things while you go and you gotta be quick and you already have to have the foundation. So it's not a big time. And kind of where we got into the expert is, all of these things improve over time. So the more you do, the easier it is next time. It's, I've already done this registry report and I know it's not gonna give me what I want. And, and you know, Red Ripper over access data, registry, right? You know, which one is going to do the right thing for me? Should I build my own custom templates? I don't know. It's just, these are things you learn. So the open solution set example I always give, I used to give another one and then I read to Brian Carrier in 2008 and he actually used this one I liked a lot better. But you arrive in the break room, there's five people drinking coffee, the coffee pot's empty. You know, how do you determine who drank that last cup of coffee? It's an open solution set, right? You got to think there's a hard grilled veteran detective out there that could bust that case in five minutes and me, right? I, I don't know, Jack. Uh, you know, it might take me five hours. But uh, anyway, anybody want to give me an idea of how do I determine who drank the last cup of coffee? Right there. Ask them, okay. Interview, that's in there. All right. So this is my first round. Temperatures, the amount of coffee in each cup. The strength of each coffee, right? It's gonna be stronger at the end. You guys wanna keep going? I got about 10 of these. This is one of the questions I ask everybody who ever works for me. Like, give me something new. What's that? 
Okay, they're, they're right. There could be a six cup of coffee out there. Amount of coffee grounds, right? You know, hopefully there's more at the bottom, so the last person might have some more. Obviously, there's interview, uh, interview group, interview individuals. Yep. Video. There you go. Does video exist? <laughs> Develop a timeline, right? You know, measure the temperature of the cup versus the temperature of the coffee. That was one I got a little while back. That is actually from the yeah, Brian Carrier example. He's actually doing it for a different reason about the statefulness of computers. But uh, yeah, offer reward. I like that one too. So it's really great. I get some all new ones and uh, I'd like to add them. I don't have them all listed. I keep a little low wall of uh, this example. But uh, it just kind of shows that there's many, many ways of doing it. And how do we get the most optimal? How do I become that real detective, right? <laughs> no, last one? Yeah, that one's fine. <laughs> We were trying to come up with off the wall at some point, I think over a beer, and uh, I was like, we're just going to hold them, right? It doesn't have a good payoff because it might be a really, really long time. But anyway, the point is, is there a combination that can produce a higher probability answer? You know, what can I do? It's always tough to get like the smoking gun that's 100%, but you know, you get enough, enough data, enough information to draw conclusions and support those conclusions, conclusions, you're pretty good to go. Be efficient. And this is what experts do, right? So these guys right here in this row, they're all sitting together. They've probably done a ton of these things already and say, this is enough to provide the conclusions that I need. Let me know when we switch. And then this is also another, it's a thought experiment, um, kind of the same line where I'm saying this is why we did this and this is why I came up with some of these things. But if we took three different skill levels, let them talk to the requester, ask them any darn question they want to ask them, get a timeline and go do it, what would we really expect if we had an expert, uh, kind of somebody that's been doing it for two, three years, and somebody that's pretty new? You know, what are the results going to show? How varied are they going to be? And of course, that's what I'm trying to fix, right? So if we gave them 20 hours and said, oh, you know, forget unlimited time, you've only got 20 hours to produce a report, you know, are the findings going to be different? You know, is the expert going to knock it out in two hours and go drink some beer for the rest or what? And then drop it into eight hours because that really happens in real life. I get things and they're like, we need an answer by the end of today. Right? And does that mean I'm going to do, you know, super timeline, which is going to generate for six, seven hours? No, it doesn't. So anyway, um, where we fit in, and this is for the analysis phase, we don't, we're not really going to focus on the, what the methodologies do right now. I mean, they do a great job of telling you to go get the data and to grab the data, but when you get to the analysis phase where we put up that DOJ and they were like who, what, when, where, and artifacts and all that good stuff. How can we do a better job of maximizing our time with the requesters, right? I mean, a lot of places have forms and things like that. It's, it's really hard to have an interaction. I think the biggest thing for me in original digital and forensics investigations is getting that right initial contact down, right? They're going to come in there and say, this is what I think I want. And you're going to go in there and say, this is what I can do. But how do I maximize that? How do I really get, like, these are the goals? And how do I come in there with some pre-knowledge of what case types are or what exactly they're asking for? So these were kind of our goals and the questions that we had as we went. And can we really achieve consistent results in the field? You know, I think we can get better, but, you know, actually every consistent? No. So here's what we came up with. Um, and again, this methodology is just an overview. Sam's going to get into a little bit deeper. But we have really set it up so it's part expert system, part process. So when you go in and you're talking to them, we've got, we've got a tool that we're working on. We really wanted to have it done before we came here, but uh, it didn't happen. Um, but anyway, it's got case types. And a case type might be compromised machine or intellectual property. And on there, they're going to have common case goals. I mean, these are the things that you see all the time. I want to know if this document left or, you know, I want to know who this person emailed and all those good things. And so you start with that case type so you can go in there with a little bit of knowledge or have it on hand when they start to tell you what they want. Um, we broke it out into three. The quest is going to want something. Um, you're going to have common things. And then there's also going to be analysts developed because during that initial pre-analysis phase, the last thing you really want is you know, that requester coming, getting your report after all this work and saying, oh, you know what, I forgot to ask you. I want to know if this, this malware compromised any of my other systems. You know, so that's why, you know, you got it in front of you. It's going to be a common case goal for compromised systems. Do you want to know if there's additional exposures? Uh, once you get that, it's golden, right, to get the agreed upon case goals. You've got to walk away with it. It's got to be solid. It's got to be consistent. It's got to be <laughs> just completely understood by both sides. Because if you go out and if you're working a case for a lawyer or something like that and then bam, you give them what they want and he's like, great, I can't use it, right? You know, I really needed to know if these PDFs ever existed. So if you can't get that, you're just, you're in big trouble and you're going to have to go back and you're going to have unhappy customers because they're spending a lot of money. So anyway, uh, by developing the required list and the beneficial list, you can provide a case estimate. And that's something I really like because 
trying to get better at case estimates is a really, really big deal for me um, because you get people, you get these expectations. If you can be as you know as close to correct as possible, then you know you're not really having people that like I thought it was only going to cost a thousand dollars, or you know I thought it was only going to take ten hours, and my lawyers are waiting, standing by. So, getting into the analysis, I'm going to go through because Sam's going to go pretty deep in this. Um, you know, determine the methods, and this is kind of where we started getting into that optimal case business, right? We wanted to say, you know, method A, we want to find out how this machine was compromised. What's the best way, right? What's going to take the least amount of time? Just going back to that coffee cup example, you know, what's going to be the the best answer in the shortest amount of time? And then uh, we, for the SPM, or I'm sorry, for the uh, analysis where we do an index. We're actually estimating the analyst skill with that method and those types of things to actually generate what we call the SPI and uh, put some time limits for reevaluation. So if you think it's going to be a four hour job and you start getting into six, you know, maybe you need to look at, hey, putting this one on hold and going for something else. That's it. Well, not. So some of the details, right? Um, we want to develop um, an analysis phase for digital investigation, right? So we want to have a good uh, understanding of what we're trying to accomplish. And then uh, we're going to try to organize because every type, every case type is not the same, right? Malicious activity uh, case type is different than child pornography or uh, examining a cell phone uh, for uh, malicious activity. So there's all different types of cases. So we need to kind of organize our cases differently and then have different type of goals for each case because uh, we just cannot use a standard um, answer, uh, standard questionnaire for all the different types, uh, type ca uh, case types. And then uh, the other thing is we want to do also at the beginning, as they've mentioned, implement a time management process. So we know uh, for this type of case, if the hard drive is 80 gig uh, data on it, it has 80 gigs of data, and we need to analyze it for this type of uh, case, then most likely we're going to have these four or five goals that we have agreed on, and they are going to take us uh, X amount of time. So um, we want to definitely kind of understand all of that and know what we're uh, looking at. And then uh, part again is the expert system, right? An expert person will just automatically know, okay, I have 120 gig drive, I need to produce these types of results, it's going to take me five hours, ten hours, whatever the time might be. So the goals uh, of the methodology, right? Uh, develop better pre-analysis information. This is like before we even start, we know what we're dealing with, right? And then um, achieve better time estimation. And then uh, how do we provide that information? So um, the three components to our uh, methodology are the pre-analysis, analysis, and the structured time management. Um, the pre-analysis we define uh, in depth what kind of information we want from the requester and how do we uh, get the right questions in there. And then during the analysis is when we sit down and we try to figure out how do we answer those goals that we have agreed with. And then the structure of time management kind of fits in in both of those phases. Initially when we develop the case goals we know how much time we're going to estimate to spend on it, but then during the analysis we kind of have a measurement of where are we spending our time and how much more time do we have left. Can we achieve those five goals with the uh, left out time that we have uh, on our plate? So um, the pre-analysis phase, really we broke it down into two different uh, processes there. First is uh, you meet with the requester. That's the easiest one. You sit down and say, okay, what do you want uh, at the end of the day? What kind of information should I produce? What are you looking for? Um, you know, he says, well, I want you to find out who compromised this machine. But then as the expert, you want to go back and kind of refine those questions and get the information that's going to help you at the end of the day to produce the report that he really wants. And so you can, that's a more iterative process. You have a conversation with the requester and you go through the different uh, questions that he is asking and you produce uh, or you refine his questions to give you the information that you need. Some bigger uh, forensic companies, they have developed their own questionnaires and they use those as a standard. Uh, they're pretty good because you don't have to meet with the requester. He fills out the, uh, the answers to the questions that you have there. there. However, they, take, they tend to take a little bit more time uh, and then sometimes you might not get that personal interaction with the requester and kind of really understand if he is getting the questions that you're asking on that questionnaire. But just different types of um, questions that you can um, ask or you can get, the, uh, get it from the requester. Then, um, so we, we've got the information from the requester. We know what he kind of wants. Then an expert is going to say, well, okay, this guy has that, but for this type of case, I know 
that these are common goals that should always be answered, right? So uh, we find out how this machine was compromised. That's what the requester asked us. And then the forensic analyst will say, well, determine what the attacker really did on this machine. I mean, yeah, we know that it got exploited through MSO 640, whatever it is, but it really, what did they do after they got into the machine? Um, and then we also can have uh, common uh, goals based on uh, case type. And um, this is basically what we kind of see the industry usually does, right? From network break in, these are the types of logs. This is the type of information. I want firewall logs. I want IDS logs. I want all of this information. That's a standard procedure that you're always going to ask. And then, as a forensic analyst that has some experience, they're going to come back and say, yes, uh, this is really what they wanted. This is what the industry says we should do. But really, to solve this case, these are some of the additional uh, goals that I need to include here to provide that information. And then, um, we, we are gathering all these goals, right? And then we also need to have a process to give us a time for each goal of how do we determine what's the time uh, that's going to be needed to process that uh, goal or to deliver that information. Um, and then this is where we find out the required information and also what's beneficial, right? Uh, we must have the image of the system to process the case, right? But it would also be very useful for us to get the logs from the firewall or from the other machine, uh, for the other machines on the network. Um, and then what does this uh, give us really? Uh, after we have done this outline, we really have not, we really know what we're after. Uh, we kind of have a, a schedule or a plan of what are we going to attack now. Uh, we have the primary data points and then uh, we know what our resources and what our uh, time is available and then we need to start breaking it down in terms of the tools and everything that we're going to use. But this is going to give us the information to where we need to get started. And then um, I think the determination for the case type, you know, if we have a malicious activity, um, standard goals, let's say 4.2 methods that we need to use, and then the analysis, uh, the analyst says I'll need about 20% time to, you know, produce this type of case, then we can generate a um, SPI index that will basically help the analysis know how valuable it is or how much time and effort it's going to take him to produce this goal. And then again, um, this is what we mentioned at the beginning. It's the expert that, does, that goes through his head and says, this is what I usually did do for this type of case. This is what I did last week. These are the things if I need to produce the registry report, the web browser history, and these other things. Usually it takes me five hours processing time. I'm going to add two hour buffer time. And then I should be able to get the report done in ten hours. And then um, the case goal estimation time, right? This is very uh, important to be able to produce to the requester at the beginning or after that first initial conversation and tell him, okay, I'm going to probably need about 10 to 15 hours because uh, they need an estimate so they know how much, um, how much you're going to charge them at the end of the day. And so producing the appropriate uh, time estimate is really going to tell them, well, you know, this guy is really good. We asked for all this information, but really we can't afford it. So we'll cut some of the goals out, or no, we're going to add some more goals because we really want more information out of that. And um, so I think the next thing is the analysis. Yeah, I just want to add on to that. <clears throat> There's that expectation you get right away. I mean, you know, whether it's internal to your organization or what, just setting up that expectation. If they really think you're going to do it in 10 hours and you end up at 20, 25, you know, you're not making friends. You're not, you know, giving them the trust in you. So, uh, that to me is a big reason for estimation and getting estimation dead on. <clears throat> so now we get to the fun part, right? It's the analysis. This is where you get, actually get to sit. You know, you've already got your goals and you've given an estimate of how long it's going to take you to do. So yeah, we want to achieve this, the case goals that we've determined and we've agreed upon in the optimal time, right? So we developed an index so we could rate all the different methods of solving that goal. Um, it's just a simple algorithm and uh, we want to generate the highest probability based on the time. So we actually used a probability. We wanted to use a, uh, well, it was like a, a, just a different algorithm that was actually used for gambling, you know, about probability and how much of your bankroll you should use. But uh, the SPI is generated based on effectiveness, level of effort, compatibility of your tool sets, whether you have them is a good reason. And then the familiarity with the, me with the method, right? So if you've never used uh, Red Dripper or any of, the, any of the registry tools, 
you know, we want to know that because then we can actually help you estimate which one is the best for you. If you've already got experience doing X, Y, Z, yeah, that's going to come out with a little bit higher. Uh, the software we developed actually has it where you get to choose some of these things and you can add values and it can actually, you know, dynamically and you can actually use it in the pre-interview process when you're talking to the requester, you know, when you're working up those goals a little bit, you can actually see those numbers if you so choose. Uh, for methods, you know, this is actually in the software. It's right now it's in a spreadsheet that, you know, we've almost got uh, ready. We had some problems with Chrome and I didn't want to just put it on Firefox only. <laughs> so uh, anyway, but it's just, this is what we list as for each method. And so what we're hoping to do is when you have a case type like, you know, intellectual property, then we're going to have a whole bunch of methods, right? And so if you've got, uh, you know, review usage data, you're going to see super timeline and you're going to see, you know, registry rippers and you're going to see link file and, and then all kinds of good things like that. And these are the fields that we use. Not too, too exciting. And uh, the goal of it really is to get the best bang for the buck, right? You know, this is what we think will give you the highest probability of solving that case goal. You might have ten, you might have two, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna run it through. And I think I already went a little bit to what we mean by methods. We specifically didn't want to be tool based, right? We wanted to use generic things, you know, generate web history or generate system usage or or whatever. But we just didn't want to get into specific OSs. That's something that you can wait of an SPI, but uh, you know. Um, that's also where the expert comes in, right? An expert's going to say this is the right tool for this right job, and it may fit into a category of you know web history generators. But you know if you're looking at uh, I don't know 60 gigs of web histories, you know you're not going to use uh, something small, right? So a part of it is that uh, it is a probability based. I threw the function up there that we use. Uh, I also threw up. You can take it right off the slide and drop it into a spreadsheet if you really want to do it yourself. It's really not too too exciting. Um, I wanted to break out machine time and person time because a lot of times you can have machine time running, 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 and your person time is what takes up the is is the value when you're doing this. So if you've got something that's 10 hours of, of machine time and one hour of person time, I want that to be weighted higher than the reverse. And of course, we couldn't address everything, right? You know, you may not be willing to buy. Uh, whatever forensics toolkit for five, four or five thousand dollars or whatever they charge right now with its Oracle license. But uh, you know, we also didn't know what the expertise was. You know, so I wanted to have a, some some things in there saying, hey, you know, some things may be heavy scripted, and if you don't have that, then you know, we don't want F SBI can't predict that. Uh, we we try to be very descriptive in the methods and kind of what this method is and what it does. Uh, but then also, uh, you know, types of environments. You know, if you don't have anything to look at, uh, my BlackBerry or my iPhone, then um, you, you know, we just couldn't foresee that in this algorithm and, and listing of, of what to do. Uh, I think the big thing here is really that it's, it's experts have these things already. They already know what tools they have and they already know what they're missing. If they get a forensics case that's mobile based, they're going to say, I can't do this. I need to send it somewhere else. Or they're willing to go out and buy it. Um, but, uh, you know, they also understand the failures of methods, right? You know, which ones were good, which ones are bad, which ones miss, you know, how did I miss a deadline, and what did I do wrong? And so we're just trying to really take that data and plug it right back in. It's what I do. It's, you know, when I got my teams, I'm like, oh, you know, first, you know, when they're new, I'm like, break a case down like this and then go after this and go after this. Because I already knew that, you know, hey, you're going to get better results with the web histories than with pulling the registry, right? Or you're going to do better than, than going through and scanning all the files and doing your uh, keyword searches, you know, from indexes, building a giant index. So it's kind of that's what experts do and it's, it's trying to take some of that back. So there's two factors in the time estimation, right? There's the data size, right? If you get a huge uh, amount of data, you know, I need, to, I need to be able to account for that in the SPI because that goes to the machine time in a lot of cases and hopefully what you get out in the back. But then there's the skill level. And like I said, that's the skill level comes into determining what is the right tool for the right job or knowing the limitations and, and saying, oh, you know what, this, this web history doesn't even know about Chrome. You know, why am I going to bother with that? Um, providing the ability to budget time based on the expected results. Um, it's a good way to go. It's, it's really set up that goal. And then that way if you go over, um, you know, by your 20%, you're like, okay, stop. You know, maybe this isn't the right tool or maybe this isn't the right method that I need to use. And of course, that ties right back into the time management strategy. So you've made it past all the drives, is you? Or is it still me? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, you made it past all the methodology and hopefully so we get a little bit more entertaining here. Um, we, I, I wanted to take three cases but it turned out that it just got so big and un unwieldy that we couldn't, we just did it with one. Um, the case study that we're doing is one of the intellectual property cases. It's actually a combination of about two or three. 
You don't have to read that, but that's what you would get in the SPI. You're going to get this thing that says, here's what a case type is, right? The experts here, they already know what intellectual property cases are and what they normally involve and those types of things. Um, in this particular case, the employee left, started a competing business. The, the higher date and last date, um, they were, we were given those times. And then they, they had an assigned workstation. And so we, of course, had to go image that workstation. Give me a time check. So we went to the initial meeting, right? And of course, this, in this particular case, this wasn't through uh, my organization, it was through my own digital forensics company. They got there and they're like, we don't know what to do, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're, we're sitting there in that initial meeting and they're just like, I, I, you know, what? You know, and we're like, well, did they take your vendor list? Did they do this? Did they do that? And so we actually generated the common case goals and they were identification of specific documents and parts of documents. So we knew we were going to have some fuzzy hashing in there and system use and you had, did they connect the USB and copy stuff off and all these good types of things that you normally get. And, uh, <clears throat> wow. That's not cool. Let's Sam uh, do a little magic there. But uh, so these were kind of the agreement of goals. What I walked away with, right? It was you know we want to know about the USB, and it was amazing that kind of once they got going, they really came up with a, a big, big list of um, a big list of like here's all the things we want. And then once we started kind of bringing it down, and it's not a typical. I think typically you're working in an organization. Move that over a little bit. You're working in an organization, and then they kind of know what they want, and they're not completely new to asking for things like this. Cool. So this is what we ended up with in the agreed goals, and uh, we added a few, right? We uh, we wanted to extract some instant message laws because right away we saw there was some um, definitely recovered deleted files. They never even mentioned that, and uh, we performed a memory analysis before we went and uh, shut the machine down. So we got our required information. Again, this is what experts do. They don't even think twice about it. They just, you know, these are all they, in this in their head. These are the one, two, three, four, fives. The big methodologies that we talked about earlier, they don't really cover a lot of this. They're just, they're really focused on getting you the image and getting you the authorizations and the warrants and then going through and finding this stuff and building a report. And so we were really focused on just in this analysis phase, how do we go and, and how do we go in through this? So anyway, we got our beneficial information. Uh, we actually got them to give us a full case background, which was pretty cool. We got all the names, and this is one of the things I like to do, and I'll mention it later too. I love to build dictionaries of all the different you know words and things that are important to a specific case, uh, not just like run them, not just throw them into a big giant uh, search list, but actually then go back and prioritize them. So we actually they gave us all the work product names of the processes they do, and all these unique, distinct names that were going to help us find things. Um, so anyway. So for the pre-time, we actually came up with 28.5 hours because they had a lot of goals. And that includes all the processing time and all that good stuff. And uh, so anyway, so we pulled up and these were some of the common uh, methods from the, um, sorry, the common methods from the, uh, from the SPM. And uh, you know, there's some good ones. And I think later I actually, here we go. We pulled some of these out and actually these were the SPIs that were generated. So in this case, they are a little bit out of order. It was really extraction of emails for analysis based on the case goals we had, recover deleted files because we, um, just because of the time it took to do it and the value that it had. And then of course the fuzzy. Um, and again, if we were just doing it for one case goal, you know, we would probably start with the top method. But when you start getting into multiple case goals and, and, and tiering them, then a lot of times you just set things up to run. The hash files is a must do, right? And so no matter what the SPI is, because they want parts of a document to see where it existed. And sure enough, and I'll get into some results later, but <laughs> they actually took the uh, some of the work product and just took their name off and put new company in and had copies on their workstation that they worked at, you know, the previous employer. So that was fairly interesting. Um, here was some more for system usage. I love Super Timeline that wasn't a part of it originally. Um, it, you know, it's been gaining popularity and uh, with some of the new tools they can actually, you don't do anything really. You just plug in your shift workstation and, uh, you know, set up the, was it logged time or time to log and it actually goes and finds all the, everything it can for, for the time, Super Timeline and puts it together. It's a fairly long process though. So as you can see some of the SPIs that I could do with the registry analysis and those types of things were going to happen faster and they were what you want to do. Uh, because super timeline analysis is mostly you don't touch it until you actually get to the analyst part. You just let it run for five hours and then you look at the results for the time you care about. That was pretty good. 
So again, if you're an expert, these things all come naturally to you. You know the case better than I do, so you're going to say, oh, I know I exactly want this. I'm not going to even bother with this PI. But uh, it's getting that knowledge back, right? How do you help out the, how do you mentor somebody else? Um, it's this kind of thing that can help you. Because you can say, as, as a mentor, you can say, here's exactly what, what you should do, but it's hard to say here's why, right? You're, you can break it down and say, this tool is better than this tool in this particular job that does this particular thing, and here's what they're licensed for, and here's what we don't have a license for. So those types of things. So here's where it gets hopefully a little fun. Um, here's what we found. We found uh, obviously the identified documents, those were easy enough to find. Uh, we had lots of link files that actually led to them taking documents, putting them on their USB drives, and then, then looking at them. So it was, uh, it was pretty easy to put all this whole thing together. Um, there was a hash match, hash match to the zip file for the name needed, and it was actually um, the name of the new competitor.zip. So we found it in a variety of ways, but uh, when we broke out all the, all the zip files and, and looked for the specific files, they really, really cared about those vendor lists and those customer lists. We found that. Um, we did a lot of fuzzy hashing. Uh, it was something that uh, we just ran in the background, and then we didn't have too many false positives. Um, and it led us to directories of the new company's name where they really just took out like the entire contracts and just, just swiped out their old name. So they weren't even going to pay a lawyer to build a new contract for, <laughs> for contracting services. So it was kind of nutty. And um, uh, yeah, the extracted and processed mail was really interesting. I'm not going to go through it all, but uh, I think we're doing good on time, right? I'm not going to go through it all, but uh, yeah, there was a ton of IMs. It was amazing what this guy was actually doing. Um, Let's see, offer sent to FedEx last minute. So we had the whole, when they got you know, um, asked to join this new company, uh, it was actually they were partnering with somebody else to start the new company. The exit strategy, there was a how-to, like here's what you should say when you leave. <laughs> you know, and here's the best way of, of telling them that you're going to a competing company and that uh, you're hopefully you know, going to take everything with you. So it was also a lot of pros and cons. There was a great conversation between the, uh, the significant other. It was like, I don't know, maybe you shouldn't do this. You know, this person's really been good to you. So it was pretty amazing. Um, and it, it all happened pretty fast. We, we actually came in a little bit under the 28.5 because um, some of it was just so simple to find. I mean, you got to love somebody that just puts it out there for you. But uh, this is one of the things I do. I'm really big on dictionaries um, where you can take all the different names and the different part cases that you see, just write it down as you go, and then you can, you can prioritize them. So as the case starts to develop and you see where uh, the important information is and, and what, um, what uh, you know, is important about the case, I guess is the biggest way of saying it, what's the real goal of the case, you can start you know, then using those specific keywords to help you dig it down. The last thing I hate to see in the world is where you just got somebody sitting in front of the screen, access data, X ways, in case, whatever, and they're just looking around. They're going through browser, the, the little browser, and they're looking at files, and they're like, ah, uh, let me just scan the web history. No, no, if you're, don't just scan, right? You want to actually want to develop the web history, get your timelines, and look specifically what you're looking for. I think there's a talk right behind me called Sniper Forensics, and it's kind of, that's what we're going after, too. We just don't want you looking around and, and paying attention to this, or, hey, you know what? I found this cool word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to search for it now. So it's really just write down that cool word, and then you can prioritize it to stuff better. Anyway, registry analysis usually has a great SPI, so of course we did that, and we found tons of supporting data uh, for all the accessing files and changing files. Once we had identified the files with kind of all the other, the other methods that we used, we were then able to generate it completely. Super timeline, I know it didn't exist at the time, but we know it would have definitely made the cut for getting processed, and then we, because we started, we actually had solid timelines. Uh, for these events and you know, kind of the follow-up, uh, we analyzed the web history. That was fun. Uh, always good stuff to there. There was a little porn on the work site, so you gotta love that. And definitely wasn't little people porn, but uh, it was great. I just it blows me away that people are gonna sit on their workstations in their organizations and look at porn during the day. You know, we see what time it is. You've got a system clock, so. <laughs> I'm never, I, I guess I'm just never, I can get over it. I'm always amazed that uh, just the amount of people that will choose to look at porn in the workplace. Uh, great conversations, trashing. So we had some great IMs. That, that was one of the ones that we put in there because we, we knew that there was some uh, instant messaging that was going on with the uh, competitor. And then, of course, there was lots of discussions and who to take with them, right? They're going to start their new big company. Who are they going to take? So we met all the goals. We had defendable data and conclusions. It was pretty straightforward. This is probably the easiest case in the world, uh, you know, that we were able to get in a really good time. We actually came under. 
Uh, we rechecked our primary findings with multiple tools. It's something I believe in. Um, there's been so many times where, you know, I've run a tool and I got a date, say an MFT date or something like that, and it turned out to be in the wrong order, right? The tool had a problem. And you might be familiar with it, but, you know, that's why you check it. You know, you take the sleuth kit or, you know, autopsy or x waves or whatever you want to do that's on a different thing. Just validate your finals, right? So here were my personal conclusions from the case. This guy really does fill out his ID10 team forms in triplicate. I mean, it, just, it was amazing, right? It's an idiot. But it was just amazing that uh, there was just so much information about what he was going to do and how he was going to sell it and who he was going to sell it to and how he was going to take these contracts. And I'm surprised they just didn't walk by and actually catch him. But uh, he does, does he even own a home PC because that's where that stuff should have been. And of course, eraser and CC cleaner and TrueCrypt and all those good things. Um, so that was interesting, right? I think I covered all of that. That was just interesting. But a big thing I'm also, uh, that isn't a part of SPM, is just judging your performance, right? So feedback can be shaky because if you didn't find exactly what they wanted, they're going to they're gonna be like, yeah, well, you know, it would have been great if you did this or if you did that. So it's, it's hard to actually take that feedback and have it be meaningful on what you do. And so I actually did try to weight some of the metrics that I use and I push on my teams. Uh, the number of follow-up questions. If you did a good job in the pre-analysis phase, you're not going to get all these follow-up questions. They're not going to say, oh, great, uh, how about uh, where did this file go after it got sent to our mail system, right? You know, you could have looked at the SMTP header uh, for whatever when they wrote replied back or whatever, but you didn't, right? Because they didn't ask that and you didn't know you to go looking for it. So it's kind of getting those agreed upon goals. That's a good metric for it. The number of goals that they requested versus what you were able to draw out of them, right? So as you get better at interacting with the with the client, if it's a form, you know, you're set on it. But when you're talking to that that person from either from your organization or from an external party, you know, they're like, I, I want this. And then how many goals can you draw that are more specific of things they really want? And so that's a great metric, I think. Um, the amount of time, estimated versus total. As you get better, experts are really good at making that estimated time equal very close to that total time, barring something crazy. And then, of course, the um, <clears throat> total predicted value versus actual value, right? So it's here's what I think I'm going to be able to get for you, which is always a dangerous statement when you're talking to somebody with a forensic um, investigation. But it's, you know, it kind of comes out there like, what do you think they're going to get? And they're really trying to draw it out of you. So it's actually what you were able to kind of predict versus what was going to happen versus what you actually gave the requester. And of course, I really count this, and this one's important to me. It's the number of wrong turns. And I am known for making mistakes, learning from them, and then, you know, hopefully getting better. I really believe in it. Look where you make a mistake, focus on it, say, hey, I'm not going to make that mistake again, you know. So those are kind of my big judging your performance metrics. How are we doing on time? Are we way under? Okay. Uh, so anyway, um, <clears throat> even if you don't fully invest in this methodology, right, and you get something good out of it, just really, really focus on defining your case goals better. Um, you know, even if it's just your boss comes down and says, hey, I want this, 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 he can be your requester, right? So you can do a better job of like, hey, tell me what you really want or let me help you develop that, right? You don't have to use our tool or our, what we're trying to plug in as far as estimation of time and how long it'll take you to do what. But uh, do, do, just make that your primary goal. Uh, you're going to find the stuff, you know, using your tools, good or bad, but, um, or you may or you may not, I should say. But I think really getting that better, better definition and just agreed upon is the way to go. Um, and then improved from familiarity with your common goals. You know, you work in a place, you've got a lot of compromised machines. You know, say you're doing um, graphics, right? You're porn on the workplace and they want you to develop, you know, what porn? Were this person, was this person looking at porn? And were they looking at it this time because that's when the complaint came in? But they'll say things like, um, okay, how many? Because they usually care. And then they usually care about a history, right? Is this person just looking at porn once? Or they've been looking at porn like four hours a day for the last 20 years. So that, that's the kind of stuff those departments are going to want to hear. And if you're not thinking about that, if you haven't already done a ton of cases where for whatever reason you're doing investigations, whether they're looking at who's going where on the firewall or what, those are the kind of things that you'll want to say to them. So uh, have been familiar with what types of cases you do and how they normally follow out. If you're in a group and you're the new guy, you know, ask, does this exist already? You know, what are the questions that we normally ask when we go through this? You may get hand-holding for your first couple. You may, you may not. Um, I definitely believe in mentally organizing methods with the best bang for the buck. Mentality, which is kind of the whole smith petresky uh, methodology and index, but uh, then in developing your internal time management. So even if you don't, you know, use any of the, I think, good stuff that we have, um, that's what the value really is. Um, we're going to do questions in 113. 
thanks a couple guys that helped us out. There's our contact information. Uh, Kyle Davis, Mickey Lasky, Scott Molden, yay, yay. And then I'm always going to leave on a few extra thoughts. And I guess we can take some questions if we've got a little bit of time. But uh, like I said, I like building those dictionary of account names, email addresses, all the stuff you think is important. Don't go, don't break off your primary task and go looking for it. Write it down and then it can become meaningful later. You might write down an email address and find that uh, you never had a reason to go look for it, right? And you would have, you might have if you weren't disciplined to, to push it off to the side, spend 20 minutes going through and looking at false positives and all that good stuff. It's always kind of crazy to sit there and just search for single words and then get a result and search for single words, my opinion. Um, keep the little case goals handy, right? It's great for actually making sure I'm a mental checklist. And then, of course, uh, I actually print them out and I, I scribble on them as I go. And then it helps prevent case overkill, which you might find yourself in sometimes where, you know, you've got already drawn conclusions, you can back up your facts, you've, you know, but you just keep going. You're like, oh, I also found this email and I found this email. And how many pieces of, you know, other than getting a number of how many graphic pornography, pornography uh, images were on this machine, the total number, you know, you don't need to look at them all, right? You don't, <laughs> maybe fun, but you don't need to. And then, of course, a couple of cases, uh, we had reporting deadlines. And so, and that was the kind of thing where it's, uh, experts have to have their testimony in by this point. And so I include raw data, because what's really funny is they, they tend to make that, draw that line, and then do depositions after experts turn in their things. So then they'll do, find something in the deposition that's, this person says that they, uh, they emailed this. And if you didn't actually have it in your raw data, you can't, because your report's in, and then you can't create a new report after the deadline. So I tend to put some raw data in there and just, it's ignored by everybody, but uh, it can be used, you know, after the report. So that's just a little lesson I've learned. And that's it. Yeah.